Lynn May, thank you so much for coming on the NRS and podcast. Appreciate you being here today. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. All right. All right. So uh, I asked you what was a win for today. And I asked everybody who comes on the show, usually what is a win for them? So I understand what we want to get across. But before we get into that, I kind of want to know what your background is. So my background is uh, I was I'm an immigrant in the country. I was born in Lithuania and came over uh, when I was six years old. I uh, lived in Philly, uh, was the uh, kind of kid that would a uh, teacher would call on you and uh, my mind would be drifting in a, a whole bunch of different directions. So at some point in my teenage years, I got diagnosed with uh, ADD, attention deficit. I wasn't a hyperactive kid, so attention deficit disorder. And I put on all prescription medication. And, uh, you know, I can't say it didn't work. It de depends how you define work. It, uh, it helped me to focus, but it took away my sense of self. So my connection to myself wasn't there. And uh, I was hanging out with some older kids in uh, in school. And uh, before I went to class, they asked me if I wanted to smoke a cigarette. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to be hanging with the cool kids. I'm going to smoke a cigarette. So uh, I never questioned why they only had one cigarette. It was weird, but they had one cigarette. And they're, they're passing around. There's like four of us or, or, or five of us. I got the cigarette and uh, I inhaled it. And it tasted weird. It didn't taste like a cigarette. And I uh, went again and I maybe uh, coughed a little bit. And they were laughing at me. And they put cannabis in the cigarette. So when I went back to class, the windows that were open in my head sort of narrowed and I could focus. So I never said anything to anybody, but at some point I got off my prescription medication and they used cannabis as my medicine. My parents didn't really care too much about that. Uh, or, and what, or year was this. This. what year was this? This is a good question. So I would say this is probably 1985. Okay. Okay, so then the 84. people we called stoners across the street of the high school uh, really were there to learn more. <laughs> That's it. That's me. <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm getting at that is because I listened, did a whole podcast on somebody else about cannabis, and yeah. I listened to um, uh, what's his name, Doctor Humerman, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And he they, he had a guy on from Canada talking about it and how the difference between joints back then versus joints today and how much you take and smoke what you have to smoke to get the the same amount from the seventies weed and yeah. everything else. That's just what I thought of at the time. Yeah. Well, he's, he's kind of right in a way. Uh, and it has to do with the, the amount of THC uh, right. that's in it, but you're absolutely right. And, uh, and uh, what, what the difference is between the weed today and weed tomorrow is, uh, or weed yesterday is the amount of THC that's in in the cannabis itself. THC is a very narrow therapeutic window, really. So what happens is all these people have genetic predispositions to these adverse events of having, you know, anxiety and stress by taking too much THC. It actually triggered the expression of that, turn the switch on, and now these people start expressing these things. So you know, Huber is not wrong, but the, the funny thing is, well, it parents, wasn't him, it wasn't him that was it was some it was his guest who was explaining oh, his guest that was came true. on because he had done another show about it, and the guy from Canada called him and got a hold of him and said, "You're wrong." Oh, that show, yeah, I know because he had a, a very negative uh, connotation around cannabis. I remember listening to that. He, right. yeah. So he had the, and this was just a recent episode where they talked about it, uh, and, he, and the guy was talking about uh, CBD and how he thinks it's more of a placebo effect because how much you got to take of it because most weed has had the CBD taken out of it, from what I understand from the episode. I don't know. This is not my world. <laughs> I'm not in that world, so I don't understand. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really has very little to do with weed per se. It has to do with a system that's within all of our bodies called the endocannabinoid system. So, you know, going forward, you, you asked me uh, background wise. Uh, so when my parents would catch me, uh, eventually they ended up kicking me out and calling the cops on me and trying to have me arrested. And the irony is they, they consumed products that my company later on produced and now are big advocates of that. But you know, uh, went to school. It's a different went, world back in the 80s, though. Totally uh, different yeah, world, yeah. 80s and 90s. No, it's a different world. We were all, you know, your brain on drugs and Reagan and Nancy and all, all that stuff. So, well, they also showed the pictures of people who had the marijuana lace with something else and how it destroyed them and everything else. So, yeah. And, and, that, and that's important because when you have a black market product, you know, there's other things that are risky. It's risky. If you have a product, it's the same thing as all prohibition. You know, alcohol prohibition uh, was also problematic uh, for people. But, you know, 
I went to physical therapy school. I spent my time working at Tower Records, uh, working my way through school at Tower Records. If anybody remembers, it was a totally remember. Where, where are you located? Right? California. Yeah, I'm in LA, but uh, I'm, I'm from Philly, so I worked in Philly. Right, right, but no, I'm just saying because I mean, um, I saw over here Studio City on your little yeah. thing. So yeah, yeah. that's, that's so I was in San Diego for over 20 years, and then I lived in LA for a couple. So before yeah. I moved up to Northern California. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, uh, and, I, and my daughter goes to Berkeley, so I go to Northern Cali uh, to visit quite often. But uh, yeah, so I worked at Tower Records and uh, worked my way through college. I went to physical therapy school. Uh, opened up uh, an internet company in 1992, exited in 95, was doing some with music. My ex, my girlfriend, who was my ex-wife now at that time, said I have to get a real job. So I went to work for uh, uh, a company called Price Waterhouse, and then mm -hmm. it became PwC, did some venture capital work, decided that I like real estate because I made an investment and became a commercial real estate broker, was a managing director of Keller Williams commercial, brought me over to California and I uh, moved to LA and uh, through real estate, got into the dispensary business. That's why I have a little bit of background in the cannabis space. And in that business, I noticed two people will consume the same chemical variety, but of a completely different experience. And sort of my ADD kicked in where I had to hyper-focus and uh, found a video of a guy that genetically sequenced cannabis, approached him, and started working together. So I would go around the different cultivators who would grow cannabis, get plant material, bring it to my lab, extract the DNA, sequence it, and we created the first library of genetics for the plant. And the, the parent company that owned that company uh, did pharmacogenomics, which is the study of how drugs affect individuals' bodies and how drugs interact together. So my sort of light bulb moment was, well, we have cannabis genetics here. We have human genetics here. Why don't we bring those two together and guide people to a more personalized experience so they can avoid a possible adverse event of what, you know, the guy was talking about a human. So we started that in 2017, the company's EndoDNA. And uh, from there, you know, we have patents, uh, et cetera, in our technology. From there, I started thinking about just all right, so it's the endocannabinoid system. It's just one thing. But what about just medicine and wellness altogether? You go to a healthcare professional, they tell you to take two of these. Well, why? They haven't really looked at my metabolic function. Maybe I'm an ultra rapid metabolizer. Maybe two is not enough. Or maybe I'm a really poor metabolizer. Two is too much. And what about the interaction with other things? How about my supplements? I take you know, 14, 15 different supplements. How do I know that the medication I'm taking is not interacting with that? So we started expanding our company into a precision wellness company using DNA to guide people to a personalized experience. Hmm. And what? so you, what's the name of that company? EndoDNA. Okay. E-N-D-O-D-N-A. And what do people just go there, sign up, get their DNA checked to understand what they should get? Yeah, I mean, we, we mainly focus on healthcare professionals, but we do focus on consumers as well. It's it's sort of like a very similar test to an Ancestry.com or 23andMe. You go on, you order a test or you get it from your healthcare professional, comes to your home. Inside is a big Q-tip, a buckle swab. You swab this to your cheek. It's HIPAA, it's GDPR compliant, so uh, we don't take your personal information. Uh, that remains separate. And uh, you register that and you ship your sample to the lab. It takes a, a few weeks and then you get your results and the results will look at your genetic predispositions to different things. It could be like a nutrigenomic report where it can tell you you genetically have predispositions, low iron levels, low calcium, low zinc, uh, you know, B vitamins, uh, D6. Now you can adjust your lifestyle to be able to modify that. So if you have low iron levels and low calcium levels and you decide you're going to be a vegan, let's say, well, you need to probably subsidize that because you're not getting a lot of that iron from your diet. So now these are ways to, for you to be able to uh, supplement for that. And the difference between what we do and most other companies is not only can you upload raw data from any other DNA test, but we give you an interactive treatment plan. So here's you, your predisposition to something, but here's also the action plan that you can take. And then we measure the efficacy of that by patient reported outcome and also biometric feedback from your wearable device or whatever. So it's a, it's a fully uh, functioning feedback loop model for precision health and wellness.
Okay. The reason I'm, I'm like, look, thinking about this, because I remember t after my regular DNA test, I could have swore I took a totally different test, just like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but this would have been, what are we in 2024? Would have been in 19. What, were, you, were you guys doing it back then or no? Uh, we launched uh, 2017. Okay. No, I just, because it was, it did, it told me like the same, kind of the same stuff. I don't yeah. know, maybe not exactly because it's so long ago. Like, I'm not going to tell you, I, but it was just another form of trying to find out what, because I did a lot of triathlons back then. So I wanted to see what I needed to do differently to make sure I got everything. Because a lot of people who um, are taking like Ozempic or other stuff, you know, they don't realize you, if you do a high protein diet and you work out, you're not going to lose the, the muscle mass that you should, but people don't understand what they should be doing. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. right. I, I I'm not sure if this is a Peter Atia thing. Uh, I'm gonna give him credit, and if somebody says that it was somebody else that said this, uh, all right, fine. But <clears throat> I was listening to his show, I think, and he said that there's a study that came out. People are using these uh, uh, like like an Ozempic type of uh, uh, of drug. They're doing DEXA scans prior to that so they're right. looking at their that was their... huberman it just oh recently... was that huberman it, it was like it was either him or that guy that just did his separate one from who was it gary brecker anyway one of anyway, those guys I, I just listened to that too so. yeah and he was yeah. saying that uh, holy shit i mean you have you're looking at people are losing weight but what are you losing you're losing your so in a, in a normal weight loss it's like uh two-thirds that is body fat and one right. third you lose muscle and maybe there's some bone density this is the flip side of that it's the opposite of that so you're losing two thirds uh uh muscle mass and bone density and one third uh, fat so at some point people are looking skinny and brittle and as people get older you know they're gonna uh, start getting injuries especially when their bone density decreases or muscle mass decreases so yeah well maybe this was a different one but they're talking about how a high protein diet on that stuff and and weight lifting actually resistant training will keep the bone the, the you know the muscle there and that bone stuff there where most people don't eat right on that stuff they eat the same they were eating just less of it yeah, no, it makes total sense. And I have a few people that I know that are on uh, Ozempic and what they're saying is they're just not hungry. So mm -hmm. they're forcing themselves to eat. And you're absolutely right. They're they're continuing to yeah. eat. Well, here, I'll give you a look. I'm on it because okay. I, I was a president of my rotary and I gained, I mean, I, I hit 291, which I haven't been 291 for years when I was super big and lifting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm pre-diabetic. Yes. I kind of got around the whole system because it's, but anyway, I lost 30 pounds within the first six, uh, five weeks. Okay. And the difference was I re I read everything, listened to everything. And I said, okay, I, so there's liquid protein that is just protein. Uh, there's other ways to get your protein than food. And you need to, you have to get the amount of protein you want, whatever your number is, you're going to get to. Right. Say if you want to get to 200, that's what you set your protein at that you're supposed to do. Right. Whether male or female, you figure that out yourself. But you can get it through other sources than eating meat. You know, I mean, I, I eat meat, but I'm just saying that you need to get that protein in to not lose that muscle. These people aren't. They're eating three bites of a cheeseburger. Yeah. Makes sense. And, and that's why they're losing all that. And because I've lost no, no really muscle, uh, you know, because I, I walk five miles a day with a 50, with a 50 pound pack to keep, you know, to exercise. That's why I lost because I'm not hungry. So I'm like, I might as well take advantage of this at low doses to see how much weight I can lose so I can get right off of it. Well, then you, you but you, you have a different, different agenda. Yeah. You have a different agenda and, and you're more educated. Most people are not, and you're absolutely right. They're they're just not eating. They're losing muscle mass instead. They're losing everything. You're right. And and that's sad because you could do it. The whole purpose of it wasn't for me to like to cheat it out easy way. Dude, I was a triathlon person. I did all the I lifted a lot. I, I got in a bad car accident when I was in my early 30s. And my doctor and even the chiropractor was like, you need to start lifting some weight to strengthen your back. I took it a little far. But that's beside the point. Uh, but you know, I went from barely pushing up 135 pounds, six months later, pushing up 415 on the bench wow. and a bunch of other stuff. So I got pretty big, but that wasn't it's just because when you first start lifting, you take off. 
Mm. You've been lifting for years. The advance that you get to is not that much. So, but so I, I just had never changed my eating habits. Mm. You follow what I'm getting at? So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was doing triathlons. I ate like I was lifting as much as I used to lift. And you can't do that. You have to cut it way back. So I used it to help curve. And the other is I grew up dirt road poor. Yeah. We, after my dad died of hairy cell leukemia. And, uh, and so we never had food really. And so I got in the Navy and I found food and I worked out and I, ne I was never big. But then later in life, you know, like, oh, I like wine. I like this. I like, you know, so, you know. How yeah, it food, it's always your relationship with food. I mean, it starts as a mental game. Right. So when my, my parents, uh, you know, my dad grew up uh, World War II, right, right afterward, like they had no food. And I remember as a kid, I was super skinny and I wasn't like I didn't eat much. Right. My parents wouldn't let me leave the table until everything was off my plate. And, you know, for kids nowadays, it can create eating disorders. You have to be really careful with kids these days. But for me, you know, I would cry in my food and my, my parents are in this in the living and watching TV and be like one pea left in the plate. Like I'm done. No, no, no. Your plate's not, not finished. So, you know, I, I have this mental connection to food. You can't leave things on, on the, on the plate. You got to finish everything. Right. So get smaller plates. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's what we don't think about. You know what I mean? There's so many ways we can, and that's why I was like, okay, I could do this myself. It's going to take a lot longer, or I could do this, change it, have, you know, get to a point where I'm used to eating a certain way. And, and I, and I did one more thing. I fast till noon. Yeah. So fasting alone was one way I lost a lot of weight a long time ago. I, cause I've done whole 30 where I've lost 30 pounds in a month. And I, you know, but the problem is you, you're like lethargic because you have no, you know, you have, you're trying to change that, how your body is adapting. Yeah. This isn't supposed to be a show about extra, well, about uh, diets and everything, but it's just, I just think we were, we brought it up. I thought I understand this because I'm on it. Yeah. But my goal was, you know, I, I, I was on a quarter dose, went to a half dose and the, and I'd lost, but I plateaued at 33 pounds mm. in a, in a, you know, I think it was eight weeks. And my doctor's like, okay, once you hit 27, you know, whatever that number, you know, the, for your weight and your height and all that stuff, um, BP, whatever that's called. Um, he goes, they're going to make you come off of it. So let's hit you to one so that you can finish what you want to do. Cause my goal is about 50 pounds. I want to lose. I want to get down to 225 that I haven't been there forever. So. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, that's good feedback. Cause I, I, like I said, I, I didn't, all I've heard was that, you know, I'm not hungry and you can and see not. people. You feel like you, you feel like you want to be you're sick to your stomach for a little bit and then when the doses increase mm -hmm. then for, it takes about two to three weeks and then you get hungry again that's interesting but even even like it's interesting you brought that up because of going back to sort of this precision medicine precision wellness so they have these doses that are not going to harm you uh th supposedly right you you start low and you titrate up from there right there's other things that are going on in your in your body that you may want to supplement for. So if you don't know this about yourself in advance and you're not eating, like you reduce the amount of eating that you're doing, how do you know what you need to compensate for? Maybe you need more calcium. Maybe you need to eat more spinach or broccoli. Like how do you know these things? So, but by understanding your genetic predispositions, it allows you to have better control over your lifestyle so you can control the epigenetic expression. And that's sort of how you know what the, what the goal of what, what we do is because right. i even during this time i put one of those sensors on for glucose yep oh four weeks in i was like dropping like my blood pressure not blood pressure but my glucose was so low my wife's like you gotta eat something but i felt fine yeah i did the same thing so here here's an example if you go to a regular doctor i am petrified of getting my blood drawn and i'm all tattooed that's me, that's so me. Yeah. So I, I don't mind the needles. It's dude, not I the have needles. my own personal cuff. <laughs> dude, you know exactly what I'm, I'm telling you, man. People don't understand. They're like, oh, what do you mean? You're your needles. No, it's not it's not about that. So I went it's to go get my blood. Tell you have high blood pressure through the roof. I went to get my blood drawn and uh, oh, blood drawn or blood pressure. So I thought no, you said blood drawn, uh, okay, you, okay. blood pressure, but also blood, blood pressure also. But I went to get my blood drawn. So, you know, I, I, I fasted. You're supposed to fast. Or at least I thought so. They they asked me, "Did you have water?" I was like, "No." Well, drink something to give me some water. I get I get really really stressed. So 
just just so you, I, I haven't eaten meat in 15 years. I, I do eat fish. I don't eat sugar. So I've uh, I you know I drink alcohol once in a while. So that's my my sugar and, and fruit commerce of that. So I take really good care of myself. I'm uh, I, I focus on everything. I do all my microbiome testing, everything. So I'm, I'm I'm pretty healthy. So I go get my blood drawn, and they're taking my blood. And uh, at some point, I hear uh, Denise, Denise, and I can't see anymore. So I'm passing out. And uh, they run over, and uh, they're like, "Oh, well, let us get you some juice." They gave me some juice. Like, okay, you feel better? Yeah, like, yeah, I, I'm okay. All right, we're gonna continue. I'm like, what do you mean? They go, well, we have to pull the needle out because you're gonna go down. <laughs> I said, I told you guys, don't sit me up, like lay me down. So they, they, you know, got my blood, and I come back and I talk to my doctor, and I have a functional medical uh, doctor. So I'm talking to her, and she's like, everything looks great except your blood glucose level is high. I'm like, well, it doesn't make any sense. I don't eat oh. sugar. Like, well, I know. Why. I think exactly because of my cortisol level, because of the stress. I secreted cortisol into my bloodstream. It actually raised my blood glucose level. So a doctor that doesn't know this, that this whole history, they would say, high blood sugar, let us give you a pill for that. So what she said, if you're concerned with glucose monitors, I wore the same thing as you. And I started monitoring what I'm eating, where my blood glucose level. And it's funny because I had like a Starbucks drink, not even like a fancy sugary drink, like a matcha, my, my blood sugar spiked. I had a Thai noodle dish, my blood sugar spiked. So I started looking at that and what the things I'm putting in my, in my body, but it was it was definitely that blood glucose level that spiked because of my cortisol level, because of the stress. So these are the things that you have to learn about yourself and know before you say, hey, you know, give me a pill for that, which is what right. we're used to. Right. And, and, and it's really look at it multiple times because I was taking AG1 you know, AG1. And mm -hmm. I went into the doctor like, Oh, your, your liver thing. So high off the thing. I mean, I know exactly what it is. It's AG1. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, so I took it off for a month, went back in perfect. But it's, yeah. again, you have to be careful with everything you're taking. You might take something too much. So. Yeah. You, and, and this is the whole thing. And, and dosing is really important. I, I think I brought this up earlier, but I, I can't stress enough and, and just going to even the cannabis route. So, one of the things that uh, method of consumption, and it's in everything that we do. So if you're going through your liver, now your liver metabolizes it. And now you're, you're getting the metabolite from your liver. Well, how your liver operates and how it functions will determine the, uh, uh, the amount of medicine or whatever supplement that you're actually getting into your bloodstream. So if it's cannabis related, it, you can be a really poor metabolizer. And if you're doing an edible, well, you can have a slower onset, a very powerful onset, and can last a lot longer. And you mentioned CBD. So for me, I'm an ultra rapid metabolizer of CBD. So I would be the kind of person that says, CBD doesn't do anything. Well, how much do you take? I take a dropper full, exactly what it's written. And I do it sublingually. You know, I put on my tongue, I swallow. Well, if I'm an ultra rapid metabolizer from swallowing and it goes to my liver, then I'm just peeing it out. I'm creating expensive urine for myself. So I need to take two to three times the amount because I metabolize it really quickly. So understanding how you metabolize is really important. The dosing of everything that you put in your body. Well, that episode that we were talking about with Huberman and the other person, they were saying that, that, and I don't know, this is just repeating. So you can tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, is that the test for CBD is was done where the people who had uh, kids had seizures and it was 1500 milligrams they were giving them of of it where most CBD is nowhere close to that, like gummies yeah. and everything else. <laughs> and the amount you would have to take to get the same benefit. So they were saying that most gummies are more of a placebo for people where most people get stuff from t the actual THC. That's because... Yeah. CBD was actually taken out of the drug. And this is just repeating what I heard. So tell me yeah. if I'm wrong. Yeah. So not all the way wrong, not all the way right. Um, can, can I give you sort of an overview what the yeah, endocannabinoid yeah. system is? All right. Yeah. So so I'm just going off because I've been listening to all this stuff because I know people really into it. And I was listening to that and they're in my, you know, in my wife's like, hey, would you want to? And I'm like, well, this is what I'm hearing. So why would I want to do that? 
it's it's not it's not totally wrong. There could there is a placebo effect. But by the way, there's a placebo effect in every single thing that we right. put in our bodies right. anyway. So it th could be. But we have this system called the endocannabinoid system. It was discovered by uh, an Israeli scientist, Dr. Rafael Mishulam, in 1992. So anybody that's you know went to medical school before that never even heard of the system, and even afterwards they didn't teach it uh, much uh, in in uh, medical schools. But the role of this system is it's a primary modulating system. So its goal is to maintain balance or homeostasis in our bodies. And the way that it does that, it gets signals from the other systems, our endocrine system, our immune system, our digestive system, sends it up the central nervous system. So like salmon swimming upstream and to the brain. And then the brain makes a decision which neurochemical to secrete and release in order to get that system back in the balance. So the two endogenous that means we created ourselves endogenous endocannabinoids that we use one is called anandamide the other one is called 2-ag so the word ananda means bliss in sanskrit that's our bliss uh, molecule and we feel that so we get the runners high when we're running that's some anandamide with adrenaline and dopamine that's being secreted uh, as well so by, by consuming phytocannabinoids so delta 9 thc uh in its decarboxylated form, meaning when you heat it, it drops what's called like the acid molecule. And there is a receptor binding of that delta 9 THC to the CB1 receptors. So CB1 receptors are located in your brain and central nervous system. So when it binds to that receptor, it actually releases an andamide. So we're getting more of that anandamide. So it's not the drug is li a ligand, uh, really the THC, and it's the, our own uh, endogenous we produce ourselves uh, molecules that give us that effect. Uh, 2-AG is secreted from the CB2 receptor binding. So we consume CBD in its de decarboxylated form. It has an affinity for the CB2 receptors, which are mostly located in our immune and our digestive systems. So anything that creates inflammation. So when you consume CBD, it's a really natural anti-inflammatory because it helps to secrete more of that 2-AG or reduces that inflammation that causes their pain and discomfort in the first place. But the interesting thing about all this is that we have genetic predispositions to some of these adverse effects. So uh, if we have a fight or flight experience, if uh, uh, Ed's crossing the street and a car comes out of nowhere, almost hits you, you have that fight or flight. So you have some dopamine, you have some norepinephrine, you have some cortisol, you have some- By the way, uh, that happened last weekend. Well, <laughs> I was walking the crosswalk and the lady didn't even like, and I yelled, thank God we're walking our animals and she almost took me down. And it's like, look, lady. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I'm no, sorry. but it, well, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty, it's pretty yeah, ironic. She was, that and I, the reason she, up. I was looking at the lady looking at my wife instead of looking straight ahead and before she ran me over. So. Yeah. Well, you were looking out for your, for your wife, but, uh, the, so, so you have these neurochemicals that secrete and, and cortisol. Right. Now, when your brain realizes that, you know, the danger is over, two things happen. There's a reuptake of the neuro, of those neurochemicals and your brain secretes new neurochemicals. Uh, so the new ones happen to be anandamide is part of that. But if we have a gene that actually, there's a gene called FA, fatty acid amide hydrolase. It actually creates an enzyme that metabolizes anandamide. So if you're producing less anandamide than the average person, that cortisol can stay longer in your bloodstream. And what will happen is, Mm, you can lower your pH level. So your immune system can overreact to that, which will then, and then if you have gut health issues, it can actually move into your gut health and trigger IBD, et cetera. So if you're, if you have these predispositions, then your, your immune system can overreact to that. And what you'll feel is pain and discomfort, most in your joints, ankles, knees, hips, neck, back, et cetera. Now, most people say, you know, I'm having, uh, an issue with my uh, my knee or I'm having neck pain and stress related. Okay, well, what do I do about it? Well, let me take an, a pill for that. Let me take an analgesic. So it'll reduce the feeling of the pain, but it's not doing anything to actually address what's causing it in the first place. So by taking a ratio of cannabinoids, the THC works as an analgesic. So it actually binds to your receptors and, and addresses the feeling of the pain, while the CBD is supposed to reduce the inflammation that's causing the pain to begin with. So to answer your question all the way back to the study that you're talking about, the study is for a drug called Epidiolex, and it was created by GW Pharmaceuticals that was then acquired for 
a few billion, more than a few billion by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, an Irish company. And their focus was specifically childhood epilepsy, or some called Dravet syndrome. And uh, the people that were talking on Huberman are correct. The amount of uh, CBD is five to six times higher than it is in your normal quote unquote dose that you would get, you know, somebody uh, in a store bought uh, CBD. But the, here's the challenge. Number one, it's for a specific disease and condition. Yeah. So they found that the amount of CBD to address that condition has to be high. And they're probably right in, within a certain range. Number two, they have a black box warning that they're, it can cause liver damage. So you have to find, and they never did a metabolic study or, or a PK study to find out, uh, you know, pharmacokinetic, to find out what the dosing is based on metabolic function. They just did an average across the board. But for some people, you know, taking too much CBD can actually create some liver uh, challenges. But this is what your way. It's, we, we dealt, my previous company, we deal with a lot of people that have uh, palliative care cancer. Uh, six months to live and they extend their life right. years to go. Well, you have to make a decision. Is it quality of life or am I going to be sedated all day? Well, you know what? I'd rather have better quality of life and I'd rather not be in pain. And I'd rather, is it going to damage my liver? Possibly. But you get to make that decision as an individual yourself with knowledge you learn. Well, they were, they were just saying, he was just saying, use the THC because you get more of the relief than if somebody wanted to take a CBD gummy for sleep, you know, to sleep better, that was a placebo effect because you're just not getting enough in there to, to help that. But if you, THC would be different. He, he was just saying that from what they just generically yeah. that CBD, the, the dosage of it is so low because it versus THC stuff. It, it just, it, it doesn't make any sense because there are completely different substances that, that affect different parts of your body. And by the way, if people are taking too much THC to help them sleep, they create active brain. So your brain is actually going to be right. still going. You can pass out and be tired, but you'll, you won't create Delta and, and theta waves. So you won't have restful sleep. Well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like caffeine. You take too much caffeine, you fall asleep. And then, <laughs> then when it goes down, you wake back up. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Lynn, anything else you want to get across today before you go and how do people find you? Uh, no, I just, uh, the only thing that I want to get across is that we're all individuals. And when we are taking and putting anything in our bodies, we should know genetically what is our genetic GPS. So we know where our own personal potholes are in our own road. So with that knowledge and understanding, we can make better decisions about our own personalized health and wellness. Uh, so where people can find me, I am on all the social media platforms, Len May, and I think it's Len May DNA on, on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Len May, our website is endo, E-N-D-O, DNA.com. I have a, also have a podcast called Everything is Personal, wherever you can uh, find those. And I have a book called Making Cannabis Personal, and you can find that on Amazon or wherever you buy books. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you being here. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you.